Well, good evening, sisters and brothers, and welcome to our week three Monday edition of our Gospel of John uh, Bible study. I'm not sure if we should call ourselves 7 o'clock live or live at 7 or whatever that you guys want to do there, but just know that we are, again, live all this week, Monday through Friday, 7 o'clock right here on the Facebook page with our summation video loaded up on, on Saturday. I hope everybody enjoyed the video from this, this past Saturday. I think Dr. Witherington is a wonderful teacher. I think he presents the material in a way that is uh, easily digested. Um, I think sometimes experience may be those with uh, multiple degrees speaking at a level that maybe is above their, their audience. What I appreciate about Dr. Witherington is he says in a way that even I can understand it. Uh, and I appreciate that and I hope that you appreciate what he adds to our Bible study on Saturday as well. Uh, we make a transition this week. We've gone from talking about Nicodemus last week. Uh, this week we're going to talk about another story uh, that is probably familiar to all of us, that being Jesus and the Samaritan woman, sometimes referred to as uh, Jesus and the woman at the well. Uh, what we're going to talk about tonight, and probably the next couple of days, are the comparisons and contrasts between the two stories. Um, off the top of our head, you can think about how he met uh, Nicodemus at night. He's meeting the woman at the well in the morning. Nicodemus is a man. This is, of course, a woman. Nicodemus was well-versed in all of the Hebrew scriptures. Nicodemus, uh, the woman at the well, rather being a Samaritan woman, only believed in the first five books, what we refer to as the Old Testament. But there's all kinds of different uh, contrasts and comparisons uh, that we'll go through here and then, uh, over the course of this week. Uh, just to kind of set the table, we're going to cover John chapter 4, verses 3 through 42. Throughout this week, we'll do the, I think seven, eight, nine verses tonight. But we'll cover chapter four, verses three through forty-two for all of this week. Uh, one thing I want to present to you as well that we talked about yesterday, worship a little bit, is that Thursday is the day set aside as our national day of prayer. And so if you're listening to me right now, then all you need to know is that on this page on Thursday from noon to one, it's going to be another live feed, but the stream is going to be uh, a video of our altar at the church. And so it's going to be for us a virtual prayer room. So what I encourage you to do is one of two things. It, well, I guess really three things. Uh, one, uh, make time between 12 and 1 to um, hit the, the, the play button or whatever it is you do to, to, to see me, but instead watch our altar and, and feel like you're present in the altar in our sanctuary and pray uh, for uh, your family, your community, our state, our country, uh, things that are on your heart and mind uh, that day. Uh, two, if you have a prayer request, you want to type it in in the comments section, as some of you do as we're going through our, our Bible studies, please do that. I'll be on the other side of the camera taking in all of the, the, the prayer requests and praying uh, during that hour there in the sanctuary. And then three, if you'd rather be between just me and you, uh, send me an email. And what I plan on doing is taking all the email prayer requests I get between now and Thursday morning and printing them out, placing them on the altar, and we'll pray over them uh, during that time on Thursday as well. So again, live Monday through Friday, like always, here at 7 o'clock. And then Thursday, an extra special uh, time of prayer from noon to 1, which again will be a live video or a live stream of our sanctuary to kind of help put you in the proper perspective for prayer on that national day of prayer. All right, with all of that out of the way, as far as our announcements are concerned, I want to invite you to join me as we go to the Lord together in prayer. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus and the work of your Spirit among us. Keep changing us, I pray, that we might more and more become a body of believers who are determined to be like Jesus. May we continue to live in Jesus. May we truly live and move and have our very being in Christ alone. Continually remind us that we are not our own, that we have been bought with a very great price. This day, may we live in such a way as to bring honor to his name in our homes, places of work, neighborhoods, and schools. May Jesus be seen in acts of love and kindness and heard through words of gentleness and respect through us this day and all days. May we continue to be rooted and built up in Christ. Father, move us away from the milk of your word and increase our hunger to go deeper. I ask that my brothers and sisters in Christ might truly be like trees planted by streams of living water where roots go down deep, producing fearless living, regardless of situations and seasons. May we, be, may we continue to be strengthened in our faith. May doubt 
unbelief, double-mindedness, apathy, and hopelessness be banished from among us. May we once again fix our eyes on Jesus. O oh God, in your great mercy, grant us, I pray, eyes that are able to see your greatness and glory and recognize your work among us, that our faith might increase. May we, your people, overflow with thankfulness. In the midst of a complaining culture, may we be those who recognize our many blessings and continually give thanks. Renew our hearts, Father. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, may every complaining spirit be banished from among us and may we be overwhelmed with joy and thanksgiving. May a river of thankfulness begin to flow from your church to the nations of the earth, I pray, in my community, this community of faith, and from me, O oh God. May my brothers and sisters in Christ be built up this day and the gates of hell not prevail against us. For we are your church. And it is in Jesus' name and for his glory that I ask these things. Amen. All right, so a little bit of a uh, introduction as we do every Monday as to what we're getting ready to head into. Uh, again, this is uh, John chapter 4, 3 through 42 is what we'll cover for the uh, balance of this week. Uh, but here by way is introduction. And again, kind of remind yourself of the fact we talked about Nicodemus last week. Now we're moving to the woman in the well uh, and we'll go, go from there says that as with the story of Nicodemus, again, John presents an interaction of Jesus with another representative type of person he met during the course of his ministry. Instead of a pious Jew, we have an immoral Samaritan. Instead of a man who is a teacher and well-respected in Israel, we have a woman who is an outcast among our own people. Instead of someone who believes in the whole Old Testament, we have a Samaritan who believes only in the Pentateuch or the first five books of the Bible. The contrast could hardly be more stark to understand just how stark, but we need to say something about Jewish views of Samaritans. Right, here's our background material for this week. Jews and Samaritans are not what we would call kissing cousins. Indeed, the antipathy between them was so bad that our text for this week even tells us Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Or more literally, the text says, Jews will not share a common cup with Samaritans. In ancient Near Eastern hospitality, it was normally the case that you were supposed to welcome anyone into your tent or home and be willing to break bread with them, even if they might normally be regarded as an enemy. Notice how in Psalm 23, verse 5, we hear, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. When we hear that Jews and Samaritans wouldn't even share a glass of water with one another, you know there is some hatred involved. Jews believe that Samaritans were, at best, lapsed Jews and, at worst, immoral, unclean, recalcitrant sinners. Some early Jewish teachers said that a good Jew should never enter the unclean land of Samaria, eat with a Samaritan, or touch a Samaritan. There were nasty Jewish sayings like the land of Samaria is like a graveyard. It conveys a whole week's uncleanliness like a corpse. Or worse, a Samaritan woman is a menstruant from the cradle. She is perpetually unclean. When we look at the poignant and powerful story in John chapter 4, we should not think of it as just another story of Jesus. Read in its original context, we should ask the questions the disciples would have asked. What in the world is Jesus doing in Samaria? Why in the world is he talking with a woman he is not related to, much less a Samaritan woman? These are the kind of questions this narrative prompts in its original context. All right, so we move on now to our reading for tonight. This is John chapter 4, verses 3 through 9. John 4, verses 3 through 9. And the uh, St. John writes these words. So he, and of course, nine times out of ten in Scripture, he is referring to Jesus, particularly in the Gospels. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, or Sychar, or maybe even Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, 
Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. All right, here's what Dr. Witherton says about this passage. It says, This story begins oddly, because it was not actually true that Jews had to go through Samaria when they are returning from Judea to Galilee. But Jesus chooses to heal. So what he's saying here is, is there was a quicker or more direct route uh, that, that would take them around Samaria. You know, if devout Jews didn't even want to set foot in Samaria, certainly there were paths around Samaria to get from Judea to Galilee. But Jesus says here he had to go. So this is not so much a geographical had to, but more a theological or ministerial or evangelical had to, right? He stops at a famous well, the well of Jacob near the town of Sychar. Since the Samaritans only believed in the Pentateuch, their spiritual heroes were the patriarchs and Moses, not David and the succeeding kings. Quite naturally, Samaritans would take umbrage at anyone who seemed to be suggesting that he was greater than one of the patriarchs. This story proceeds like a slowly boiling pot as the light gradually dawns on the woman who Jesus might really be. And then all of a sudden, she is off to announce her discovery to her townsfolk. That'll come later on this week. One of the in interesting features of the Gospel of John is that no gospel more strongly emphasizes that Jesus is God the Son and so divine. It is also true that this gospel strongly emphasizes the true humanity of Jesus as well. Thus, here we are told that Jesus is tired from his journey and obviously thirsty as well. Notice that we are told it is midday. And here is where we should ask, what's wrong with this picture? What's wrong is that the women would not, did not come, sorry. What's wrong is that women did not come in the middle of the day to draw water from a well that is well outside of town unless there was a special reason. Normally women would draw water from a well or a stream first thing in the morning. <clears throat> so the story begins with an anomaly. Why is this woman, all by herself, coming to the well at midday? The logical explanation is that she sought to avoid contact with other women who also regularly went to the well. But why? We soon learn as the story develops. Jesus, too, is alone at the well without his disciples. They were hungry and went to town for food, leaving Jesus high and dry, especially dry in the throat. So Jesus asked the woman, Will you give me some water to drink? The woman is shocked. Perhaps she had hoped to get her water and go quietly back home without talking to anyone, much less to a strange man from out of town. There were strict protocols in these cultures regarding when and to whom men and women could speak. The last thing this woman expected was to be asked for something personal, like a drink of water, which would require direct or indirect physical contact. She says, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? This strongly suggests that Jesus' Jewishness was evident, perhaps from the clothes he wore. Possibly he has the tassels that devout Jews like to wear. Notice that the dialogue begins on an ethnic note. This woman knows all about the ethnic tensions between Jews and Samaritans, and she was not expecting to be addressed, much less expecting a request for water. The story has a shocking opening, a shocking middle, and an equally shocking conclusion, as we shall see. So he's kind of tantalizing you a little bit as to what's going to happen the rest of this week. So that's the impression that we get from the first uh, nine verses from this week's uh, readings. I want to go a little bit further into what I found from uh, some of the commentaries. What's interesting is it starts off saying that Jesus you know, had to go back to Galilee. And so the question would be, well, why is that, right? Well, the, que the question is actually answered in the three verses before what we just read, and that the popularity of Jesus was increasing to the extent that the Pharisees became alarmed. To avoid a confrontation, Jesus traveled north, returning to Galilee. So Jesus was basically just trying to get away from it because his ministry and his missions, his miracles, his teachings, his healings had started to raise a little bit of a concern with the Pharisees and so Jesus decided to make quick and get out of town. So he decided, you know what, I'll go to 
Samaria. It says that Christ had a compelling compassion that drove him to a woman in need. This was also the most direct route to Galilee. His journey took him to Sychar, a city a few miles southeast of Samaria and near Mount Gerizim. And according to Genesis, Jacob bought this parcel of ground and later gave it to his son, Joseph. That's found in Genesis chapter 48, verse 22. As in, in regards to Jacob's well, it says this was a well about 100 feet deep. The writer now emphasizes the humanity of Christ and that he was travel-weary with his journey and consequently rested on the well. It says, note the contrast between chapter 3 and chapter 4. What he's speaking of here is notice the, the contrast between Jesus meeting with Nicodemus and Jesus meeting here with a woman at the well. It says, in the former, which is Nicodemus, Christ deals with a man. In the latter, he deals with a woman. In the former, he deals with a Jew. In the latter, a Samaritan. In the former, he deals with a moral person. In the latter, an immoral person. Yet he saves both. In receiving this woman, Christ transcends the barriers of race. He was a Jew and she a Samaritan. The barriers of religion and the barriers of rank. Teaching us that soul winning crosses any barriers. The request for, the request for water was a logical one since the disciples had gone into the city to buy food. However, the woman is amazed at his request because of the natural animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. This hatred was caused when... After the fall of Israel, the Jews who remained in Palestine intermarried with the heathen and were called Samaritans. They were not full-blooded Jews. And then I found this I found interesting. It says that John 4 presents the reader with one of the most iconic stories in the gospel, the encounter with the Samaritan woman. Her story forms a provocative contrast with that of Nicodemus in chapter 3. Verse 4 says Jesus had to go through Samaria. This is not a geographical necessity, but a divine necessity. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Significant encounters between men and women happen at wells in the Old Testament in Genesis and Exodus. The mention of Jacob's well should remind the reader of the earlier reference to a Jacob story in chapter 1 of the book of John, where Jesus was shown to be Jacob's ladder. Jacob's ladder has now come to Jacob's well. Remember, the ladder is where you see angels going up and down from earth to heaven, earth to heaven. Jesus is our ladder, for lack of a better term, to get us up to, up to heaven with the relationship with our Heavenly Father. In a gospel that presents Jesus as divine, it is important to note that it also shows him as fully human. The Son of God gets tired and thirsty. We'll talk about this here in a little bit. Jesus initiates the dialogue with a Samaritan woman by requesting a drink. The woman is taken aback by this request from a Jewish man. This is a conversation that should not happen. She is a woman, is a Samaritan, and has a checkered past. That's three strikes. But Jesus doesn't play by normal rules. And a little bit here from my study Bible. It says the unnamed Samaritan woman is one of the best known personalities in the New Testament. Her conversation with Jesus shows that she is bright clever and hungry for spiritual reality, which we'll get to as we move forward this week. But she's also a social outcast, a person well acquainted with rejection. Fortunately, no one has ever been cast out so far as to be beyond the reach of Jesus Christ. This is good news not only for someone so obviously vulnerable as a Samaritan woman, but for all of us, because every human being sometimes feels unloved, and unlovable somewhere in the court of the outcasts as we do feel outcast do we not sometimes we feel unloved sometimes we feel unlovable but there's always one uh, that loves us that being jesus christ oh there we go all right sorry if you blipped out there for a second my our connection kind of got got screwy all right so that brings us to our devotional for tonight covering the verses that we just read uh, it also deals with Jesus' sympathy, Jesus reaching out to, to anyone, everywhere. Um, in fact, this, this Sunday, the, the, the reading is about um, John 14, 6 is part of Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, uh, and the life. And some might read that as to be exclusionary. But really what it is is an invitation for all people to come through Jesus to get to the Father. But listen to our words of our devotion uh, tonight. It says that Jesus was wearied with his journey. 
We learn from this, as well as many other expressions in the Gospels, that our Lord had a body exactly like our own. The truth before us is full of comfort for all who were true Christians. He to whom sinners are bid to come for pardon and peace is one who is man as well as God. He had a real human nature when he was upon earth. He took a real human nature with him when he ascended up into heaven. We have at the right hand of God a high priest who can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities because he has suffered himself being tempted. When we cry to him in the hour of bodily pain and weakness, he knows well what we mean. When our prayers and praises are feeble through bodily weariness, he can understand our condition. He knows our frame. He has learned by experience what it is to be a man. To say that the Virgin Mary or anyone else can feel more sympathy for us than Christ is ignorance no less than blasphemy. The man Christ Jesus can enter fully into everything that belongs to man's condition. The poor, the sick, and the suffering have in heaven one who is not only an almighty Savior, but a most feeling friend. Power and sympathy are marvelously combined in him who died for us on the cross. Because he is God, we may repose the weight of our souls upon him with unhesitating confidence. He is mighty to save. Because he is man, we may speak to him with freedom about the many trials to which flesh is heir. He knows the heart of man. Here is rest for the weary. Here is good news. Our Redeemer is man as well as God and God as well as man. He that believeth on him has everything that a child of Adam can possibly require, either for safety or for peace. I think what he's telling us here is that no matter what we are going through or what we are feeling or what despair we may find ourselves, Jesus knows and Jesus understands and Jesus sympathizes with us. And we can take great comfort in that. We talked this past Sunday about him being the shepherd who knows all of his sheep by name. Well, he also knows our feelings because he felt them, right? He knows what we're going through. And so when we take our petitions to him, he gets it. He's not some unfeeling, um, distant, non-relational God. He knows and he feels and he loves and he comforts and he's there for each and every one of us. So that'll do it for tonight. By kind of a uh, introductory night, I think, to get us ready for what's going to come the rest of the week. I do find it interesting the comparisons between uh, Nicodemus and with uh, the the woman at the well. I encourage you tonight or tomorrow maybe take out your 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 Bible, look at John chapter three, read through the story of Nicodemus, read through John chapter four, the story of the woman at the well, and see what other kind of differences might pop into your mind. What other kinds of distinctions you may see here, uh, and then of course be covered in the fact that um, it really doesn't matter. Our differences, our distinctions, what makes us different, we still have the same Lord and Savior in Jesus Christ, the same one who is, is ready and willing and able to save all sinners, regardless of whether they are the uh, high Jewish learned scholars like Nicodemus or the poor immoral woman at, at, at the well. Jesus is ready to save everybody. All right. So let's close in prayer tonight. Again, we'll be back here tomorrow night, 7 o'clock live, continuing through uh, John chapter 4. Again, do remember Thursday from noon to 1, we'll have our virtual prayer room right here on the Facebook page. We'll talk more about that tomorrow night if you wish. Uh, if you came in late, don't worry about it. It'll be saved here on the Facebook page. I'll also save it on the YouTube channel here in, in just a bit. Uh, but until we meet again tomorrow night, I want to invite you to join me as we go to the Lord in prayer together. Let us pray. O oh Lord, all treasures of wisdom and truth and holiness or stored up in your boundless being. Grant that through our constant fellowship with you, those graces of Christian character may more and more take shape within me. The grace of a thankful and uncomplaining heart. The grace to await your timing patiently and to answer your call promptly. The grace of courage, whether in suffering or in danger. The grace to endure any hardship in the fight against evil. The grace of boldness to stand up for what is right. 
The grace of being adequately prepared for any temptation. The grace of physical discipline. The grace of truthfulness. The grace to treat others as I would like them to treat me. The grace of sensitivity that I may refrain from hasty judgment. The grace of silence that I might refrain from thoughtless speech. The grace of forgiveness towards all who have wronged me. The grace of tenderness towards all who are weaker than myself. The grace of faithfulness and continuing to desire that you will answer these prayers. And now, O God, give me a quiet mind as I lay down to rest. Dwell in my thoughts until sleep overtakes me. Do not let me be worried by the small anxieties of this life. Do not let any troubled dreams disturb me so that I may wake refreshed and ready for all that tomorrow brings. We pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we say, Amen. All right, my friends, I will see you back here tomorrow night. Until then, have a restful Monday and a productive and wonderful Tuesday. God bless.